so usually what we do is we kind of start off with a little bit of WordPress news. And uh, then I introduce our speaker. And after that, we have a little, be, a little bit of Q&A, a little bit of uh, WP 101. If anyone's got a problem, this is where we kind of answer anybody's questions, little help desk kind of questions you might have. We've got a whole stream of people, hopefully a lot, a lot of developers on this meetup. Um, but first off, one of the things noticing that um, obviously with May coming up with Google, we're gonna have to kind of watch out for our websites and its performance. So if you haven't yet, check out uh, web, oh, what's it called, dot .dev? Yes, web.dev and throw your, your URL in there and see where you're coming out, see what kind of grade you're getting, see if you're getting this of a, you know, at least over an 80 score, but making sure that your, your website's gonna be, you know, okay when Google comes out with its updated algorithm sometime in May, from what I understand. They um, just they just announced that they're actually pushed it back to mid June. Uh, that's yeah, mid that's hilarious. Mid June and <laughs> it's gonna nobody's be nobody's ready. <laughs> it's supposedly gonna be a mid June rollout, uh, and, and it's kind of very slow and kind of fill, end in August. Wow. Okay. Well, um, that's that, it's funny. We were ready. We were ready last June for all for Core yeah. Web Vitals. Yeah. Um, but but that's because like uh. Actually, Web Dev Studios wrote an article, but if you guys want to check this out, I just put an article in there, like a link in there. Um, I think Core Web Vitals is like being rolled out, in my opinion, very poorly um, because Core Web Vitals is actually freeing you from the 100. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at that article, that's like a free dashboard, by the way. You can now buy, I mean, which some of you might complain, by getting your Core Web Vitals data, you're opting into Google Speed Trends. And so you're saying like, I allow for like the overall score of my website to be shared with the, the overall world. Hmm. Um, and oh, so what we you, do Google. is like, <laughs> yeah, so well, no, because here's what's great about educating your client on this. Right. You can essentially use this dashboard to identify right. pages that have low core vital scores mm -hmm. and then find the most important pages and up fix those first, right? And then the whole thing of the crux dashboard most of the time when you're doing speed tests, GT metrics, all these things, they're nonsense because they're not a real device. What it's actually doing is it's going out to the web, setting up a, a computer in the cloud, running all those tests in the computer in the cloud and delivering it. That's what things like web page tests do. In this scenario, what you're actually doing is you're having people, you're installing in Google Tag Manager, the Core Web Vitals API, which Web Dev Studios, I, I showed it to them and they wrote an article about it. You install this in your GTM, it sends the real data to your um, Google Analytics. And then what you can do is you can see what's called field data, meaning that you are, it's not data that is like, I, here I put a URL in here and how's it look? It actually um, takes the data from the user's experience. So it's, it's called field data. So if someone's on like in Timbuktu on an Oprah br a browser and they visit your site, you will get core web vital data for that. And so then what you can say to your client based on this Crux dashboard is, look, in Google Analytics, most of our users do not use Opera. So the core vital score being a 20 on Opera, who cares? 90% of our users use Chrome, 90% of our, like the other 10% use Safari Mobile. Um, so I'll get your Crux score on that. And then that Crux dashboard allows you to put in competitors. And then instead of chasing 100, you're like, look, client, like we have you at 80, your nearest competitor is at 75. That's all you need to know. Um, and that's like the point of the, and that's the strategy. Because again, like I'm dealing with sites that have like 200,000 pages right. and we can't do, you know, like all. And so, yeah. so this Crux dashboard, I, we actually sold that to clients now. All of our clients use Crux dashboard and they're like, wow, like now when anyone complains about page speed, we're like, it doesn't matter. We're doing better than our competitors. And, and you know, like, and just staying ahead of them. Um, so it allows, it's pretty cool. Like that art, that's, a, those articles are great. Cool. So, awesome. Yeah. So that's a great talk. Now next, <laughs> thanks Victor. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. Um, the one thing that I was curious about, so I know that Jetpack came out with its own performance plugin. So I'm wondering if anyone's used Jetpack to, um, I don't know, improve their performance. Um, I know there's a lot of them out there, WP Rocket, um, but I was curious if anyone's used Jetpack yet. This apparently just rolled out. Ed, you have? I have, it's trash. Oh, oh. gosh, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, there's, there's so many better ones out there. We just switched to WP Rocket, yeah. and I've been really happy with that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I had a great conversation with Mike Demo the other day, and he pointed out to me that W3 Total Cache actually has add-on services that they will like basically program the site for you. So 
if you install their plugin from inside the plugin, you can pay their developers to come and tweak and finesse your website, remove CSS and JavaScript and, you know, right. do all kinds of fun stuff. Right. So that's cool. Um, yeah. Especially if you're just somebody who's trying to do this on a bootstrap budget, um, right. being able to just do that without having hired developers is pretty cool. Yeah. But I just, I have problems with Jetpack conflicting with other plugins more than anything else that I've ever used. Um, and it just does too many things. Like, honestly, it's, if you go and you look at the settings for Jetpack, it's like everything from security and backups to now caching and CDN and, you know, it does tax calculations on WooCommerce. Like, it just does more things than any one plugin really has any business doing, I think. Right. Awesome. Yeah, I was just curious. I know, yeah, Jetpack, apparently this plugin is is not attached to the, the big Jetpack. It's its own separate plugin. So um, yeah, Eric's like, uh, Jetpack improves performance, question work. Yeah, so um, I don't know. I've, I'm glad to hear, I'm, I was just curious if anyone's going to use it. So it's good to know, Ed, thanks. Um, after that, that's, those are just the, the two biggies. I don't like to spend too much time on a, a bunch of news, but um, so I just want to go ahead and get started with talking with Victor. So um, Victor Ramirez, I've known Victor for years. I'm trying to say like yeah. five years now. Um, we both kind of hung out with WP Elevation. I think the first time we met was in New York. I think you were there for, um, uh, there was- The New York camp. meetup, like not the meetup, but like the, yeah. No, the it, was WP your, Elevation, it was work like... camp and then it was WP Elevation. Oh, okay. Was part of it. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah. Philly, so, um, but yeah, and ever since then, I just kind of, anytime you have a talk, I like to come in and listen. And even though half of it goes over my head, but that's okay. <laughs> I always learn something. And you're, you're one of the, the, the full stack developers that I always think of that has just like this massive experience. So I know you worked with, you're currently working with a knot, you worked with a DAO. Um, and of course you have your own agency. So, but I appreciate you uh, coming on here. And uh, yeah, if you're ready, we're going to talk about building customer user experiences with Gutenberg and WP roles. So I'm going to sh make sure that you can share your screen here. Um, yep. But thank you I'm so good. much for coming. Appreciate it. Cool. Uh, and then I guess if anyone cares, like uh, Jet, I just want to say, like, don't use this for Core Web Vitals, uh, Jetpack. So I just want to say the one thing that Core Web Vitals can't do, and I should like just help everyone out yeah. WP Rocket as a guide, you have to add SRCs to every single image. So meaning every image, need, not SRC. Uh, image sizes. So if you if every image does not have predefined uh, spaces, so you need a developer to like edit every template if you don't have the SRC set. So it's like the it, it, it's like a dev heavy thing. It's wild. Um, anyway, I just said uh, the Jetpack is definitely I was laughing. I, I'm, this is being recorded. So I'm not going to say what I think about Jetpack tools. But yeah, um, cool. How do I keep the chat open? Because I am going to do something weird today. I noticed that like, there we go. There's the chat. And then can someone do a reaction like on the bottom of the on the on the bottom of your uh, Zoom, there's like a reaction option when you like go to open the chat. The three dots. Is anyone able to do a reaction? Does anyone know how to do that? Yeah, I, I, it's set up. So I'm, I don't know if you can see when I do it. Can you do it? I want to see. I just want to see if it I. Shows see it. Okay, up I see a, a heart. It shows up on my photo. Okay. Boo. Okay, never mind. It doesn't. What I'm trying to do up. is recreate. Okay, so what I I'm, I know I got it. Okay, I'll also you guys show up my in the screen. participants list, Victor. In the what? In the participants list, if you open that panel. Uh, I'm sorry, there's like, I'm like, I've used Microsoft Live yesterday, so um, hide video. Oh, I think, yeah, I know I have the participants. So participants, great, okay, cool. So the reason I'll, I'll get to this slide when we get there, and I just wanna like, uh, cause like I do miss in-person speaking, um, but okay, cool. So let's get started. Uh, great, all right. So um, yeah, so as I was saying, um, this is uh, build, you know, um, building custom UX with uh, Gutenberg uh, and user roles. And I'm sure to open the chat over here so I have that if anyone wants to say anything. Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is me, quick quick blurb. Uh, I'm currently a lead product analytics engineer at The Knot Worldwide. Uh, I actually don't touch anything WordPress, I don't touch anything PHP. Um, I mostly build uh, data pipelines uh, for cloud engineering teams to uh, modify uh, data um, and build like marketing stacks. So it's like, it's like totally 
opposite WordPress, um, but it's like very high end, like big stuff. Uh, I used to be a lead software engineer at Dow Jones, uh, which is the Wall Street Journal, New York Post, London Times. And very proudly, I built a program called NewsPress, where essentially we defined what WordPress was at Dow Jones. And I got to work with human made web dev studios, big by not 10 up, but like a couple, essentially five big WordPress agencies. So I got to learn a lot, which is, I feel very lucky. Um, I'm the founder of an abstract agency. That's my uh, WordPress agency. Uh, and then I mentored, you know, teaching people to code. Uh, and then I'm also a co-organizer of WordPress NYC meetup uh, and WordCamp NYC. If that ever happens again, I volunteer with that. Um, cool. Uh, about me, I'm like, I'm, this is my dog. I just got a new puppy, a long haired chihuahua. That's Zeus. Um, and of course, they had a photo thing in my building. So of course, you know, I'm gonna get portraits of my dog. Um, so that's that, I just leave it out there. Um, so obviously forgot to update these slides, but if you tweet at me, um, is victorious, uh, it always helps just because that way it lets me know that after this, I know some people aren't as, you know, open with asking questions or, you know, they, um, you know, they wanna, they think of something later. If you tweet at me, I will respond, I'm very, active on Twitter. So if you if you tweet at me and you have a question or like, you know, you get stuck on something, you want my opinion, I, I'm very overly opinionated. So I'll give it to you. Uh, but I prefer people do that instead of privately contact me just so other people uh, get the benefit. Uh, so that's that. Um, and this is a new thing I'm trying. So the one thing I miss about speaking in person at WordCamps, at meetups, I also am like the backup at all of our meetups at WordPress NYC. If a speaker can't make it, I always have like a talk that I can just give that I may give them to a team and I will give at WPMYC. Um, and I usually gauge it by if people are falling asleep and playing on their phones, I'm not speaking well. And if people are scribbling things down uh, rapidly, I'm teaching something that's interesting. So what I would like you to do to recreate that experience, if you could either drop a reaction or an emoji in the chat and I'm gonna watch. And that way, if you guys all start giving me middle fingers, I know that I need to change tact. Um, so, uh, you know, feel free. I'm gonna watch the screen once in a while. Um, and that's like something that's been helping me when I'm speaking publicly online. Um, so yeah, feel free. All right, great. Um, and then also like the last slide on like the opening thing. This is 100% my personal and professional opinion. Um, if like you do something here and it blows up and kills a cat, it's not my problem. I'm just like, it's just advice. Uh, so yeah, uh, cool. Uh, so Gutenberg 2018, uh, you know, everyone, hated it. And this is like my emoji story, which is like, it's broken. It's scary. Um, it's like the boogeyman. Uh, and you know, that was 2018. Uh, Gutenberg 2020, uh, people are kind of like, all right, um, I get it. Some people are like, I love it. And some people are like, I still hate Gutenberg. Right. Um, but the big question that I had to ask, you know, when I was kind of putting these slides together last January, because I love Gutenberg, um, but the question for me was like, why do people hate Gutenberg, right? Um, and the thing that I came up with was, first, we have to define who are people. And this is important. You know, this isn't like, we're not getting into UX now, but UX is about user experience, right? So we have to think about who are the users in this case, right? Um, I would argue for the majority of WordPress, um, there are two types of people. And that's probably the people in the room or the people who attend most of these meetups. Uh, they're the type A, which is easily setting up things with existing plugins. Like they know how to use WordPress. They know how to install a plugin. They know how to fix things. They know how to go to forums. They know, uh, you know, they, they have a community. Uh, they know how to use it, but they may make up like 5% of the ecosystem, um, but that's valuable because they're very like vocal part of the ecosystem. They contribute, et cetera. Um, but then the, uh, you know, uh, the problem with that is WordPress touts itself as being easy. There's a lot of market confusion created by automatic and wordpress.com. I don't care saying that aloud because like that is true. Like people use wordpress.com and they're like, oh, I hate WordPress. I'm like that's wordpress.com, not wordpress.org. And then when you go to wordpress.org, if anyone has been to the five minute setup page, five minute setup, if you already have the LAMP stack set up on your computer, which everyone you know might be aware, like installing PHP, MySQL and Linux on your computer is not five minutes. Um, so that's why it's a lie, right? which brings you to type B. And so these people are like, I don't know how to set up a, a website on my computer or any of those things. And so the type B are the people who understand the power of WordPress, but all they do is constantly chase down type A's to explain to them how all these things uh, work until they quit, right? Um, and those are the other people that use WordPress. And you always hear these people um, coming back to WordPress. And the reason I would argue they come back to WordPress is WordPress, if you, and, and it, this actually recently happened uh, with like, uh, automatic, I think was mis 
interpreted as offering $5,000 websites. And everyone was like, oh, Automatic's offering $5,000 websites. They're going to kill the market. Um, but in reality, the problem is if you're, if you're trying to sell websites, WordPress is not a very good website builder. WordPress is a great CMS. Um, and that's why a lot of different tools have come in to kind of step in. So you'll always see people writing articles like, why I stopped using WordPress? Why I'm leaving XYZ? But they come back the minute they need to do anything such as you know, integrating a CRM, uh, integrating uh, any kind of marketing tools, uh, you know, doing any kind of affiliate marketing. We're, you know, Squarespace doesn't offer that. Uh, uh, Wix doesn't offer that. Um, and that's why hilariously, if anyone remembers like recently what happened, Wix tried to do marketing to kind of mock WordPress and they sent all the top WordPress influencers um, uh, uh, headphones. And the reason it failed is WordPress, those people were laughing at, at Wix Wix is, Wix is a website builder. It is not a CMS. It is not something that helps your business be online. And, you know, it helps your business be online as far as for sure. But the minute your business wants to do any kind of integrations with the CRM, integrations with the location data, integrations with SEO, multi-lang, Wix and Webflow can't do that. They're getting there, but they're not, they're not there. Um, and it's about, and that, that leads to unmet expectations, right? People go to WordPress looking for a website builder. Um, they hate it because they try it themselves. And then when they have to hire someone, it gets very expensive, right? Um, so that's what we're gonna cover here. Like I'm gonna go over how, uh, you know, how we can meet those expectations and how you can kind of fall in love with WordPress as a CMS, not a website builder. And that's where like, I make a lot of my living is just like selling WordPress as a CMS. Um, cool. Uh, and drop some emojis, by the way, if like, I'll, that's not, I'll like anyone, like uh, if, you, if, you, if you're like getting it, like if you're not getting it, just give me like, confused question marks or leave a question in there. I'll get to it at the end. Um, but yeah. All right, cool. Um, so uh, what are the what are the other options besides Gutenberg, right? Because when you go and start a site, you have to ask yourself, what are we going to use here, right? And, and a lot of people, I, I actually, I would say if you're using Beaver Builder and it's on all your sites, stick to Beaver Builder. Um, but if you can try to get into Gutenberg and I, when I go through the end, by the end of this, you'll understand like why I really like it and why it might be you know beneficial to you and, uh, and you know, some other things. Um, cool. So, uh, one of the alternatives is Gutenberg, and I used to be a page builder guy. I loved page builders um, because the classic editor was too confusing, right? Um, but some of the pros and cons that I've discovered uh, with page builders are that they are 100% focused on front-end results, meaning uh, it's very difficult to uh, show and hide certain modules. Um, it's very difficult to you know, um, remove certain uh, components of modules if you don't want to have them of a color picker. Um, there's a lack of granular control for developers. So one of the things for me, um, I challenge you to try to export um, individual, uh, and I had this with Beaver Builder and it's a known bug. Beaver Builder relies on the um, WordPress import tool, which is like, if you go into their track or GitHub has like hundreds of issues and it's not been updated in forever. So when you're moving between multiple environments, it's not great. So I like to save everything as configs. Um, meaning like in the actual PHP for version control, um, but also, but page builders, a, a pro is again, even though they're focused on front end results, they have parity on front end results, meaning that the, the client is gonna, you know, what you see is what you get. It's gonna, it's gonna look like what they want. Um, but some of the other things too, is like it has 30 different modules, 30 options per module. Um, when a place or you, a user places an item, it isn't styled. So you may have had this where you went and made, took a module, you know, took a CTA block, right? Or not block, a module, an element mentor, dropped it. You had a custom class of like my CTA module. Um, you style it to match the client's branding. The next time they go and drop that module, it doesn't have the styles. Now you're gonna tell your client to go and add a class, which is just like, think about that. How many things to be error prone? How many times short codes mess up? You're asking your client to learn a whole set of strings, right? Um, and so, I, don't, I think that page builder is not really for clients. Page builders are for the type A's, meaning people who want to have their site managed for someone else. Um, but if you're building something that you want to empower a client um, or a large organization, it's a completely different experience and documentation. I can't tell you how many times as the page builder, I would have a client go and Google how to add links to WordPress. And every tutorial they find is completely different from the Elementor tutorials. And now Elementor had a big valuation. They're like, you know, worth like however many billion dollars. They're even trying to remove the words WordPress from a lot of their uh, marketing. So it creates more confusion for your client, right? And then who do they call you? And in my opinion, you're wasting time having to explain it. No, 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 Google Elementor, right? Um, so that's like one of the other problems with page builders. Um, the other thing too in UX, um, if you look at this, uh, 
if anyone's not familiar in like in uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to share this in the links at the end. Uh, one of my favorite things to share, and I shared this yesterday, was uh, Don't Make Me Think. It's a very popular book by Stephen Krug, um, and it's all these usability things. And it's about, you know, you should have a back button. You shouldn't have more than 20 touch points, et cetera. Well, if you look at this and we say 20 touch points, one, two, three, four, five, we have like probably 30, 40 touch points right here. And so you're asking for a lot of mental weight. The minute it's a no wonder people get overwhelmed. They come in here and they're like, where do I even start? I just want to add a button, right? Um, and so for a person who isn't used to this, it's a big learning curve, right? Um, and, and, I, and again, like I'm not complaining, but this is just something, this is not good for a user who just needs to get in and do one thing. So what's next? Um, custom fields, right? And this is the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and this is like, you know, a, uh, uh, from advanced custom fields, it's like one of their favorite things. If you, and again, if you go to like the WP Elevation world, they love page builders, you go to advanced, uh, uh, advanced WordPress and you mentioned page builders, uh, they're essentially gonna like, you know, uh, mock you out of there or whatever. And they're like, oh, page builders, blah, like all this stuff or, you know, whatever. And, um, but they like advanced custom fields, which I have a problem with as well because they're focused on predefined front end results. Meaning you're telling the client it's only gonna look one way. Um, limited control for users, meaning if you don't add a color picker, they don't get colors. Um, there's no parity to front-end results. So if you have a field and you haven't clearly named that field, uh, added any kind of labels, added like what this field does, um, no one's going to know what it does. But one of the benefits is, you know, PHP and no JavaScript skills or tooling required. And so Gutenberg, the biggest complaint was people were like, oh, I have to learn React, oh, I have to learn Webpack, oh, I have to learn Gulp. Um, and so that seems very complicated, but when I show you in a minute, there's like not even a need to learn JavaScript initially to do basic Gutenberg. Um, so the benefits of, of custom fields, infinite custom modules. Like if you're not familiar, there are people who make their own block systems where I've seen people brag that they go into WordPress, remove every single Gutenberg block, and then create the exact same one in advanced custom fields. So they will remove the paragraph block and add a paragraph module that is from advanced custom fields with their name on it, their agency name of it. And then the reason I hate that is you're recreating existing functionality and now you have to maintain that. And that's fine if you're an agency and that's how you run your business. I find that goes against the grain of open source. Like someone is buying you, is paying you to, uh, you know, enhance WordPress, the WordPress experience for them. But also if you're not good at documentation and maintenance and you don't know how to manage, uh, you know, maintenance in a GitHub repository with versioning and all this other stuff, you bought yourself the worst job ever. Um, and so again, like it requires different documentation. And then when you go and make a module in ACF, there's no document, there's no documentation in ACF for end users. There's only documentation for developers. Um, so your SOL, you, you're, you're stuck managing that and you are forever the IT guy for your client. Um, and again, the other like the UX problems too are when I go here, right? And it says edit page. Um, I don't know what this is gonna look like. I don't know what I'm gonna see in the front end. I don't like, where do I go and add um, a module? What if I wanna add a modal on this page? And if you if anyone has ever used like a site like this, they usually have like a pop-up section. You go and add the pop-up, copy the short code and bring it over here. That again, like that's a whole different thing to learn. Um, and then one of the things I used to say, actually say to every job that I have now, um, I go, guys, our number one competitor for user experience is Domino's. Um, and if you're ever in New York, that's like sacrilege, but Domino's has a great user experience. You order a $10 pizza. And by the way, I, I, if you like with the kids this weekend, order a pizza from Domino's just to see how great their user experience is, where it has a pizza tracker. At point one, I can cheer on the guy putting the pizza in the oven. Point three, I can cheer on the guy in the car. Hopefully he's not driving and looking. Point five, you can be like, thank you for the pizza. I'm upstairs, I'm in the shower, I'll leave it at the door, you know, whatever. That user experience, now, of course, you guys might be saying, well, my client's not dumb. They don't know that, it, like, they know that it's not, they don't know that, like, because Domino's is a 500 person development team, right? But to them, they're like, wait, Domino's, like, it's not even like a, like a fancy store and they're, this experience is better. So, you know, people, I forget the name of uh, the, the psycholo psychology, but people, when they pay $10 for a pizza and then you give them, you know, charge $10,000 for a website and they can't do basic things, it's frustrating. And, that, and that's where the divide happens. Um, and then not even that, my biggest frustration with a lot of WordPress stuff, and this is WPMU, they write great, great content. A lot of what I learned in WordPress is from them. And so if anyone who works at WPMU is on the call, I apologize, but it ruins a WordPress website for the end user. Look at this, like, and this is an old photo, I guess it got like wherever I pulled it from that didn't work right. But uh, you know, this is like, it's terrible. It looks like a carnival circus, right? And again, how many touch points are you? Probably a hundred, right? Like this is very confusing and it's upselling. And like, this person's like, all I wanted, and a lawyer goes in here and they're like, all I need to do is update the legal privacy policy. Why do I have to deal with all this, right? Um, and so this is like, this is super frustrating. So what it like, this is like the Neo thing. What if what we can do both? 
what if we can, what if we can get the benefits of advanced custom fields, which is granular control for our clients with the front end uh, capabilities of, um, you know, something like uh, a page builder. Uh, so if this is of interest to you, can I get some emojis in here? Does it seem like, am I on the right track? Is everyone like liking what I'm putting down? All right, give me some emojis. All right, great, cool. I got one emoji, all right, um, cool. So we are going to build uh, a custom user experience for our users in Gutenberg using four plus year old code from WP. And by the way, at the end of this, I, I am going to give you uh, my code repository. It's open, cut and paste the code. Um, and I'll even show you like, when I put code in, I use something called a uh, doc block where I put links in so you can borrow the code and go and see where I got the code. And, and I'll show you the benefits of that as well. Um, cool. Uh, that's like, that's a head exploding. That's like, yeah, wow, that's amazing. I'm um, cool. So the other thing too, that I want to kind of get everyone in the mindset of when you are going and designing in WordPress or building a user experience in WordPress, there are three different opportunities to build a user experience. There's the admin, which is where you see the dashboard, where you see the custom post types, where you see all that. The editor, which is how the person edits the content and the front end. And so a lot of people, they will only do customization on the front end. So you're leaving, in my opinion, 66% of your money on the table. Because a lot of the times, like right now, I'm working with like a, this like big startup uh, that just got German investment. And now they have to rebuild all their pages in German. But we essentially set up a translation role where every page, um, and I'll get into how we can do this, where every page in the editor and admin, a translator logs in and all they can see is the post they're assigned. They can't publish the German version until it's approved by an approver. Um, and that's it. And now we don't have to train the translators. They walk into the site and they're onboarded automatically. So we don't have to worry about that. I want to show you how to do some of that. Um, so think about that. Again, like the admin is an opportunity, the editor is an opportunity, and the front end is an opportunity. A lot of people, they only focus on the front end. Um, and then I'm going to use classics such as user roles, uh, custom post types, admin columns, the admin bar, and custom templates. Um, if anyone is not familiar with any of those things, that's fine. Um, but these are like basic WordPress uh, terminology, uh, as I go through them, you'll, you might get them. But also, again, if you're reviewing the slides and review my code, my code is documented in such a way that it's all defined. Um, but the other thing I'll warn you, and this is why I really, I really like teaching this to my clients and to uh, people that I mentor or like our developers that we onboard. Um, whenever anyone hires me to hire developers, so I sometimes consult with startups to help them hire developers, um, I will, they'll say, my guys need to learn, learn WordPress. And the two courses I recommend are Zach Gordon's uh, uh, Complete Development from Udemy um, and Tanya Mork's Know the, know the Code. Um, but both of them skip a very important factor of WordPress, which is publish workflows and roles. So if you look at this, again, Zach Gordon is 100% focused on um, child themes, template hierarchy, template tags, filters and hooks, plugin development. Nothing about user roles or published workflows. Um, same thing, Tanya, and again, like, when I go here, know the code. I don't know if anyone knows how to do this. You do site, know the code. Because I even did this before. Like I was like, man, am I crazy? And I type roles. Not a single article about roles. It, like we'll talk about the roles of technology, but not about user roles, right? And so when I show you like the power of that, that is a big selling point to my clients. Um, and so and I'll I'll get to that in a second. Um, but just let you know, like there's not a lot of resources, so I can't share it with you. So just like when I show this, like I don't I don't just you're gonna have to find something. But yeah. So um, anyway, um, and then of course blocks, right? So I'll cover that. Um, so let's go, let's, let's do this. Um, so just so everyone knows, I'm using a Genesis sample child theme, a custom functionality plugin by me, um, capabilities by publish press, instead of me going and writing the custom user roles, I'm just using this plugin so you can visually see what we're doing. Um, a plugin called user switching, it allows me to switch different user roles so I can demo how it works. And then a plugin called block unit test data, which once I show you, it'll make sense. Um, and so let me just show you what that all looks like. Um, in this repository, I have clearly documented uh, our directory structure. So we have a project theme. Um, we have a project plugin. Let me zoom in a little bit here so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, we have instructions on how to set up the environment. These are little things that I just like to have for all our team. We also have like how to make changes, even all the way to like, you know, npm install, how to how to make a, you know, a PR. Um, and the reason we do that is like, I don't want to have to explain it to people. And we just use that on every single um, uh, plugin. Uh, let me open my code editor actually as well. Uh, sorry. Uh, I term and wherever that is, do do do, and this is WPMYC. Uh, uh, all right, easier to show you in here than in my GitHub. 
Um, so yeah, and that's like, and again, like the only things that we touch and if anyone has used VS Code, um, it highlights the, the code you're editing. So we get ignore every other plugin. Uh, the only ones that are highlighted are w, uh, you know, WCPHX functions um, and then WCPHX Genesis. Again, I built this repository for WordCamp Phoenix, um, but it was pretty cool, like standing room only, but they forgot to turn on the audio um, so that talk has been lost to history. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, um, and then all of the uh, custom post types and stuff are defined here. I'll go in there later, uh, but this is fully available. All right, so, um, doo -doo -doo, so jumping over here. So the scenario for this, and just stick with me because it's not actually fully built out. We have an agency website, right? So I'm assuming most most of the people here who are developers and they may have worked with, uh, you know, um, or they might have worked with an agency or they might have an agency. Um, so I've, I picked this because I feel like this topic of thinking about what are the user roles for an agency? What are the data types for an agency? I feel that these are pretty standard. Um, so uh, let's look at the demo site, right? So I went into the demo site and I uh, built in a custom post type of case studies, a custom post type of promotions. Uh, which is actually landing pages, but I call it promotions because landing pages are kind of wordy, uh, a custom post type of services, a custom post type of testimonials, and then of course we have pages and posts. Um, and again, these are pretty standard. And the reason I find uh, that it's so important to have something like promotions versus pages is because WordPress site search is terrible. Um, and so if I go here and type about, every page shows up. And so a lot of the times when I work with clients, they'll have all these landing pages mixed in here. And they're like, yeah, go to the page about. And they have about draft, about this, about that, about that. So I sometimes will even change the default pages to company pages and then call these promotional pages. Um, and then also I can separate those by roles, but it makes it easier to use. It makes it easier to understand um, for that user. Um, and then also after going increased for using those custom post types, now this is where roles come in. So let's pretend that my agency is you know, bigger than the four person agency it is. I have a marketing team, I have an SEO analytics team, I have contributing writers and I have a legal review team, right? Anyone who knows anything about lawyers is the most uh, technologically inept people. Um, and the worst thing they're ever gonna do is like, you know, you wanna get them into WordPress, they're gonna go into that and they can't figure it out, right? Marketing people as well, they think that they know everything about WordPress, they're gonna go in and start installing all their plugins. Um, so what we wanna do is using a plugin like capabilities, I am now going to create a marketer role. Um, and so capabilities, uh, when WordPress, you know, I'm gonna delete marketer just so I can do it on the fly with you. Uh, so we can see how this goes live, delete the role, uh, delete. Um, and I'm gonna go to, uh, when we go to admin, and this is like another thing I do, the administrator role I think is problematic because a lot of people, they think they wanna be an admin, but then they get access to things like the code editor. Um, you can deactivate that via, um, uh, functions or WB config, but then some people remove the plugin thing. So I can't even go look at plugins, not, but then I don't have access. So what I usually do is I rename administrator developer, and then I make a new role called admin, and then the client thinks they're administrator, but they're not, and then developer scares them. And I'm not like, and I just tell them like, look, developer has the plugin tools. You don't want that. And they're like, oh no, I don't want that. I'm like, but if you hire another developer, give them the developer role. Um, and that's fine. Um, but let's say I want to go make a marketing role. So I'm under editor, um, with this tool, I can go and uh, clone this. So I'm gonna call this uh, um, Houston uh, Marketing, or just like, let's say we have a Houston team, right? So I'm gonna hit copy here. Uh, it copied this role, so it says new role created. It has all the same capabilities, but you know what? I don't want the marketing team mess with posts. I don't want them on company pages. I do want them in media. I do want them on case studies. I do want them in promotions. I do want them in testimonials. I don't want them in categories and tags. Um, I'm just removing, what I'm doing here is just removing capabilities. Um, I, do, I do want them to go read things. That's fine, I'll leave that there. Um, and then I can add some advanced functionality. There's like types all on this side, by the way, just go and look at this to kind of show you how those work. Um, and it's like a little self-explanatory. Publish Press does a great job uh, explaining all that. So I save those changes. Um, and again, let's just like sticking with the, you know, the scenario of I only want the marketing person to deal with promotions and case studies. Um, so I went and made a fake user role here um, and I'm gonna change this person. Right now they are a subscriber. Um, I'm gonna change them, uh, mark the marketer uh, to uh, uh, Houston Marketing, right? Um, and so Mark Marketer is here. He's on the Houston Marketing team. Uh, I'm gonna save this, um, update the user. And I don't want them, they're gonna come in here and they're like, oh my God, what is all this? Ah, there's like so much stuff and forms. And again, I even, this is actually, sorry, I don't even, I should deactivate my, my functionality plugin to show you how WordPress normally looks and just to show you, you know, it's not a great experience. I'm gonna go here and I'll deactivate my custom functionality plugin. Where is that? Um, what do they call it? Phoenix something, ah, Phoenix functions, there we go. 
uh, deactivate. And now like, you know, the marketer comes in, they're like, oh my God, this is like overwhelming. Like, what is all this? And do I customize? Do I add a form? Do I add new? What do I do with all this? Right. And so I actually have a function where I turn all that off because you lose a lot of that control. All these plugins add that stuff up there. Yoast. Yeah. For some reason I need Yoast when I'm on my plugin installation page, whatever I, I remove that. So this is what that plugin does. Um, again, you can borrow the code. Uh, and now when I go back to the marketer, mark the marketer, I'm going to go and switch. And this is what that switch to plugin does. I can build a complete custom dashboard for this user. And so what we will do is we'll have a marketing onboarding, like welcome to the marketing team. Here's what you need to know. Um, and we'll have like something here. So for the language translation team, we set up, uh, we embedded a Google sheet chart. So if you're not familiar, Google Sheets lets you call the WordPress REST API. Um, and so we will call that into Google Sheets, create a chart widget, and then embed the WordPress widget. And so we have a translation burn down chart where they can see how they're doing on translations in the dashboard. Um, and that's like, you don't have to do that. I'm not gonna get into that right now, but that's the opportunities that are created here. Um, and so now this person, they can only do case studies, they only do promotions. So now like they're, they're not only locked in, I feel that they're empowered to get their job done. They don't need to worry about all this other stuff, right? Um, and so, and so like that is like a really powerful thing. And all we did was use user roles, which again, you can code them. And by the way, if, if you're someone, the way that I learned, I really got good at WordPress was whenever you see a tutorial, they're like, oh, here's how to make a post type. And they only pass two of the variables, right? In reality, the WordPress post type has like 30 or 40 different options. Um, and so what I like about generate WP it's only $100 a year and they maintain every single option available. So what are some of those options? Um, I hate when I go to a WordPress website and I do add new um, and, and, and when I and see how it says search testimonials, it should say search testimonials. Um, and it says uh, edit testimonial, all testimonials add new. The default in most WordPress uh, CPT plugins is item. And so it's like, add what item? Wait a minute. Am I on the right page? Which item do I add? Do I add this? Do I add that? What am I adding? What's an item? What's a post? And you forget we're in this WordPress mindset. And so it's very easy only by doing this label thing that I learn. Oh, wait, add new items, search everything, insert into everything. And a lot of people in ACF, they will go and remove the featured image capability because all they forgot to do was use as testimonial image. Now all of a sudden you get all the benefits of the featured image, which is SEO capabilities, all these other things. And you don't have to write a custom field or custom queries for any of your headless stuff or any of that. So this is like, that's the power. I'm not gonna get too much into it, but go through and use this. And then for roles, generate WP has that as well. There's like a generator. So you literally just generate it and dump the code in there. It's like super, it's stupid easy. Um, somewhere in here, there's a role generator somewhere in here. But that's it, you don't have to, you don't have to like you just cut and paste it. And I can show you that, like literally that's how lazy I am. We're like in WPX functions, like all the, um, custom post types, I literally just use generate WP, spit it out and then put it in here and like, that's it. Um, so yeah, um, any thumbs up, thumbs down? How am I doing so far? I'm not seeing any emoji. All right, I'm gonna assume I'm doing good. Um, another scenario too, legal review team, that's a great opportunity to create like privacy pages because a lot of different legalese going out. You can make a legal role. And then again, make it where the legal team can go and enter their own data because in reality, like the legal team, like, you know, like there's so many reviews that have to go through, it's just easier to let them do it on their own. Um, great. Uh, sorry, by the way, I did this in Phoenix in February of 2020, so I forgot um, that I already went through all this. So I'm just showing you like, again, like our types, you know, all these types of stuff, I went through that. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, but yeah, so we want to add, you know, and the other thing too, is like we're restricting the types per role, restricting access per role. But another thing we can do is admin columns per type. So one of my favorite things to do is like a lot of clients, they'll just have like a type that is like testimonials, right? And I don't have it activated here right now because I just didn't have it ready uh, for the presentation. Uh, but one of my favorite things to do is like a lot of the times when they're looking at testimonials, they don't actually want to go and edit. All they want to do is maybe update a name, update something. And if anyone knows in WordPress, there's quick edit, which isn't great. It doesn't have like a lot of custom fields in there. Um, admin columns pro, but also even generate WP, by the way, allows you to generate. There's an admin column here in here. Someone in the admin, um, that's settings. Like there's another one. Um, but admin column pro, this is an image of it. It literally lets you predefine all your columns and then allow inline editing, filtering, all this stuff. And so we'll have clients and then we'll even go one beyond where we will have testimonials um, and then we will sync those testimonials in an external API. And so the testimonials are dynamically generated via an external API. And then all the clients doing is categorizing them based on the WordPress taxonomies. Um, and then they can just see it and they don't even actually have edit capabilities. It's all just a big admin dashboard. Um, and so that's like stuff that you can like, you're building a custom admin experience for the developer. I mean, not the developer, for the, for the client. Um, 
Uh, another thing too is like custom notifications per post type. So here's one of the most frustrating things in WordPress, in my opinion. Um, there are times where you may have a type that actually doesn't need to be viewed. How many times have you created, you create, used a website or a post type or a plugin? And when you go to add new test, like I'll do a testimony right now, right? And I'll say like, um, Houston is awesome. I don't know, that's the title of the whatever. And I'll like put in um, Christina, right? Um, and I'll put WordCamp or no, uh, Meetup, uh, Houston WordPress Meetup, I, uh, WP Meetup. And I'll do email at email.com just to get it done, email.com um, and hello world, whatever, we don't image. Um, so I go to publish it. You'll notice it, it just says testimonial published, which is great because it will say post published, post updated. Again, why? That means nothing. Like that is confusing to the user. It says testimonial published. And there's usually a link that says view post. Well, if you don't have a single for that, the user goes to get a 404 who gets the phone call. You do. People think it's broken. You can deactivate that. Um, so in the code, what I've done is on the testimonial post type, um, I have only three functions in this post type. The declaration of the post type itself. So register the post type. Um, the admin columns pro. So like, like I said before, I like to say of all my settings is PHP, so I can version control them. So this is the settings for my admin columns pro. Um, and then I have this function. And to let you know, uh, every single one of my pieces of code, we, and we require this for all teams as well, to use um, keyword friendly declarations of what the function they created does, and then where they got the code sample or where they got the inspiration. So what this now becomes, I can search across all my repositories. If someone on my team says, I need to do a custom testimonial, I don't have to train a developer, I just go, type in testimonial into all of our repositories and find the code sample. Then they can just cut and paste it and modify it. They update the prefixes, they update whatever needs to be done, and that's it. So our, our um, code repositories become a uh, buffet for our developers. And it allows me to hire developers you know, that are lower level that are still up and coming and empowering them and they're learning as they go because then when they go and read this article, they got training. Um, and so what this does is actually it's saying, if a post is not publicly queryable and does not have you know, front end, da da da, do not have a preview new link. Do not say view link. Do not say show on the front end. Do not say, you know, view our all posts uh, or view all testimonials. And so that adds to a great user experience. And then what we then what we do with our testimonials, um, and I, again, I'm not going to cover how to build blocks right now. Um, why would you want to, because someone yesterday said to me, why would you want to do that? Well, the reason you could do that is with custom fields. I now have my testimonial type, but then I have a testimonial block. And in that testimonial block, it's nothing more than a CPT picker. It essentially allows the user to add a block to a page that shows all the available testimonials and they can either select a singular testimonial or select the testimonial taxonomy. So then what happens is they go and update a bunch of, let's say SEO service pages. And let's say that client quits, they have to remove the testimonial. Another testimonial will fall back in place. Um, and so that is like the benefit of having this kind of CPT um, block uh, formula. Uh, and this is like, I forgot the name is Joey for I'll, I'll put this in here. Cause like, this is like a pretty cool thing to do. Joey Ferrugio, uh, ACF block. I forgot the guy's name. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. here we go. Yep. This is it. Um, and to let you know, like the post is kind of broken, uh, but the answers on how to fix it are from yours truly in the comments where I told them what to fix. So if it doesn't work, like I gave comments there. Um, so that's, so if you, if you go to this tutorial, um, yeah, so that's, that's how that's done. Uh, how are we doing? Is everyone feeling like this is pretty cool? Thumbs up, thumbs down. All right. Great. Okay, cool. Uh, Christina told me you're all developers. So I'm like, I'm going through like some high level stuff. So I'm like trying to make this, you know, if, if someone just installed WordPress, I apologize. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, cool. So yeah, so I just showed you in the demo role. Sorry, I'm like kind of jumping around. I feel like for developers, the, the meat's better. Um, I showed you the code samples, but here's another thing, right? Um, promotions. One of my, one of the most infuriating things about, about Gutenberg itself, right, is that there's too much, just like the page builders, there's too much in there, man. Like if I go to post right now, right, and I go to add a post, right, and I go to add post, and I type video, which one do I use? I don't know. Now I have one, I've had a client use, I use video press. It, but it doesn't use my videos because they don't know what video press is. I use Vimeo. No, we use YouTube. No, do we use Animoto? No, 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 like, oh God, this is like overwhelming. Um, and so that, that's kind of nonsense, right? And so 
I normally deactivate all of those and bring back the ones the client needs. So what I will do is I will go through the client I have a spreadsheet where I essentially use the uh, WordPress API to get all of that to a Google sheet. And then I just have the client go and check off. Yes, I would use this. Yes, I would use that. Yes, I would use that. Um, and, and then they say, you know, we do that and then we deactivate. And to show you that works, remember that I told you like marketers, they're, they're like, a, they're a funny bunch. They love to try new things and experiment, right? And so I don't want my marketer like putting Spotify stuff in there or whatever. So the other thing I went and did here was I went for, you know, Mark Marketer when I switched to him or her and or whoever, you know, it is, and I go to promotions. When they go to add new, this is all the blocks they get. They only use the blocks that I've allowed them to use that I've whitelisted in here. Um, so how's that work? Uh, in the promotion, uh, and again, I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty. You can go and click any of these and, and, or in the GitHub repository, I put the code sample. You go to this guy's code sample, all the answers are there. Uh, it's probably like an exhaustive post, but all it is is passing an array of all the available blocks. And so I only allowed the ones that I wanted um, and I have a whitelist. And, and again, like the client would go, I want that back. Okay, comment it out. It's a commented code. It's super easy to do. And any developer, you can literally send to a developer in India, go to line 70 and comment it out and make a PR, done, right? $3 an hour, whatever. Like, and that's like by, by keeping it this simple and not bringing Composer and all the fancy develop, because what saves you as a developer five minutes saves, costs you thousands of hours when you try to scale your team. So I just get to, guess, to let everyone know, like one of the, the motivations behind me, like at, when I work at the Knot and Dow Jones is I wanna be able to hire developers easily. When you introduce something like a twig or like, you know, any of these advanced functionalities, you're making it harder to hire. Um, so then, yeah, so I've limited all those blocks. Um, and then the other thing I did too, was you can not only limit blocks by custom post type in the actual uh, fun, uh, plugin functions. Um, I wrote in, I wrote it by user level. If the current user cannot activate plugins, they only get certain blocks. So you can do that too. You can return blocks, uh, do that by user role. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, and just so if anyone's curious, like this is how I hit a bunch of the other stuff like in the editor. Um, yeah, and so, and then back to the editor too. One other thing I love to do, uh, WordPress has this thing where it says like the original placeholder when you, when you fire up a post, um, it says something that is in my opinion, I think Matt Mullenweg, and I'll just say it a lot, Matt Mullenweg, treats WordPress like a personal toy box. And he should, it's his thing, he created it, whatever, right? Um, but the problem is the original thing, it says, tell your story. What the shit, I don't know what that, who, who gives, this isn't my story, this is a business site, right? So it literally says here, start writing or add a block with forward slash WCPHX. And so I change the placeholder. Um, you can even do that. And it's, instead of saying, write your story, it literally says, so, so the client knows, oh wait, this is just like Slack. I can use a forward slash. Oh my God. And now I'm making it so they don't have to learn. Right. And that goes back to Stephen Krug's don't make me think. Right. And that's it. So now they know, oh, slash. Oh, and now I got my blocks and oh, there we go. Super easy. Um, other things you can do too, is like, I disable the custom colors in the editor. So they're like, oh, I want blurple or I want whatever. Right. Um, well, I don't want that. I, like we have a brand, this is a business, right? This is a business people. Um, and so how do we make them only use the colors that we want? Well, now when I go to the settings, um, that one line of code, uh, disable custom colors, they only get the colors that I allow them to have, which is our brand colors. Um, and so they can only use the brand colors uh, and, and, and they can only use uh, the brand. Uh, I normally turn off this custom one, the code might be out of date, but I also turn off the custom font sizes for certain blocks. Um, so that's like, that's even more powerful stuff you can do, customize the block editor with basic PHP. Was that cool? Anyone excited about that? Was that neat? I don't know, like that's like all the codes in there. Um, Who's the user, not a developer? Who said that? Rick, I apologize. You're going to be lost, but hopefully you should just tell someone to make it this way if you like what I'm doing. Um, you can yell at Christina for me being full on developer mode because she told me to go full developer mode. Um, all right, cool. Um, again, I went through this, like, again, I just like jumped around, uh, but you can like, the other thing too is like, you can like re re uh, restrict themes. Uh, re uh, so like you might use theme templates. Sometimes I'll go and add like a hero, right? And the client's like, oh, I want a hero thing, but I don't want them to use heroes on landing pages. I don't want them to do something. So you can even restrict, if you're not aware, you can restrict uh, this template uh, to uh, certain things. So like right now, uh, this like the landing template, which in Genesis is like, it removes the header and the footer. I would just actually deactivate that on certain types and make it the default on uh, promotions. Uh, that's not done here, but that's something you could do too. You can customize what templates are available. In, and by the way, 
everything I'm showing you here, except for the blocks, user roles, types, templates, all that stuff, that's like WordPress 10 years ago. Um, so this is like, this is all like basic stuff. You Google it, you'll find it. Um, so yeah, um, blah, 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 blah. sorry, I jumped around. Uh, yeah, that's about it. And so the other thing too, that I recommend like with Gutenberg as well, um, a lot of people don't know that you can, uh, and I'm not gonna cover this right now because it's just such a complicated topic. Um, in this Twitter thread, which I should add to my slides, um, a lot of people immediately, like that person who like rips out all of the default blocks, right? Um, who rips out all, and like adds all their own blocks. That's kind of silly because WordPress, you're getting an army of thousands of people who can maintain your site for you. Um, so what I recommend is not even going and adding new blocks. You can do things like, uh, if I want in this block to add a custom heading block, um, it's essentially just an extra CSS class. And so I'll call this like, this is a block, right? Um, or that is a paragraph, I mean, a heading. Um, the way that works is I can go here. And if you see here under, uh, I actually removed those here, but there's usually like a heading option where you can choose different heading options. Um, that's just a CSS class. So if you want to add that, uh, the way that looks uh, is that when you match the client's theme, uh, you match their styling, which I don't even know if he has a sample on here. Um, but the way that's super easy to do, and I have that installed here, um, is local.wpmesa.com and a forward slash block unit. Actually, that's not gonna show because it's uh, in preview mode. So what block unit test does, and this makes it easy by the way, for because then you're like, what blocks do I have, whatever, whatever. Um, what I go and do is I go and say to the client, uh, what blocks do you want? And then I modify the block unit test plugin. And what it does is it programmatically adds every single block that is available to the page. And so if the client has two different versions of headings, I will line both of those up here. Um, I will have all of these here. And then, and you can see this is failing because the center line doesn't work. But again, it allows you to just visually QA your developer and go, hey, uh, you know, go and fix this. This should be full width. This should be this way. This should be this. And then, you know, like the, per, you know, and some of these are off. This should be full width. It's not. Again, this is like an old, like Genesis sample from February, 2020. Um, but that allows you, and then as a visual QA, you could use some kind of like diffing tool or visual diffing tool, um, or even like there's like this visual sitemap tool that I use, I put on my client site. It allows you to essentially to, uh, um, yeah, this one, visualsitemaps.com. We put this in every single, we put this on the staging site and we put this on the main site. And then on the staging site, we update all the plugins and it will crawl every single page, create a screenshot. And then if anything changes or has a difference of more than 1%, it gets flagged. And then we know what pages need to be checked. We reset and then we go and uh, activate plugins uh, automatically. But it's like $50 a month for like 500 pages. So it's like the easiest thing to do ever. Um, but yeah, so that covers like how to style those blocks um, and how that works. Um, but, and that's like the more advanced stuff. But yeah, so all of this stuff, like the uh, the custom admin bar, the helpful warnings, like the other thing you could do with those, sorry, where I was going with the classes is, you can go and then add a class. Let's say that one of your clients, they have a problem with uh, a particular block, right? Like they say that like, oh, whenever I go to, uh, sorry, this is a block unit test, not gonna let me edit it because it's programmatically created. Um, you know, they might go and say like, oh, whenever I add the Vimeo block, right? Like. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know what to use. Or when I add the media text block, um, I don't know, you know, how this works. Or I don't know what this does. Or I don't know what this does. Um, you'll see there's like tool tips here, right? Everything in Gutenberg is editable uh, via this thing called a data attribute, which again is down here um, where it's step three. Mm, nope, the stable columns. No nope, block patterns. Uh, I think it's step two. It's essentially extending, extending Gutenberg and essentially, yeah, custom attributes and controls. Every single control in Gutenberg um, can be added or removed. Um, and so what we'll do is on, uh, on, on certain buttons, uh, like the default button uh, does not have, uh, let's do this, uh, button. You go and add a button. We will go and take the default button um, and we will not clone it, but we'll create an additional version of that block uh, using the block API. And then what we will do is we will add a, jo uh, a, a JavaScript hook where it loads a modal instead of having a link. And then we just remove the link panel. Um, that's super easy. It's like literally like five lines of code. I figured out this, this, that this year, uh, you can tell I leveled up because this is September, 2020, all of this is kind of newer. Um, but yeah, so there's like so much you can do in here. Um, and, and again, but you're just starting with PHP. Um, so let me get through this. So again, all this, none of this required more than five to 10 lines of PHP. 
it's documented for cut and paste other projects. You essentially now can repeat this hundreds of times, right? Um, and a lot of developers on the call, is anyone here, raise your hand if you're familiar with code owners on GitHub? No, no one? All right, this is like next level enterprise stuff. Code owners in GitHub allows you to write similar to a Git ignore folder and allows you to write uh, rules that if someone, um, you know, this is like the usernames, but I can also do file folders, file types, function names. So what I'll do in our repositories for our company, if anyone touches core or touches anything like that, it flags the code and lets me know that they modified the default functionality of WordPress and it automatically rejects a PR. And so code owners allows you to do things like that. So you get granular control. Um, so, so that way, again, my library is like a clean library, right? And I don't have to rely on third-party developers. All these functionalities, by the way, no extra plugins um, and it's core. So when your client is like, and so this is like when we go and train clients, we don't even write documentation anymore. We literally have a Google sheet um, and there was like a Gutenberg uh, media text block. If you type it in, these guys showed up. Uh, WordPress like we're doing better now, um, but there was someone like WP tutoring or one of them. We literally just maintain a Google sheet um, with a link to every single block. Um, and then we're like, that's your documentation. And we don't bother because we don't have to write the documentation um, because it exists already. Other people are doing it. Um, again, we can use the WordPress help section. Now when people go, they're not like, oh, sorry, I'm using Elementor on this stack. It's just vanilla WordPress. Um, and again, we only have to document the custom work, uh, which saves our documentation. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. And so you can go to uh, this repository. It's open source. All my, and again, I'm not kidding. Um, all of it's in there. Um, if you go to WP content, um, in the functions plugin, it's all very nicely organized. There's a default functions plugin that calls in the types. Um, everything's documented with a URL of how I did it. Um, all the types are in here. Uh, you know, all that's in there. Uh, and then in the theme as well, uh, the only thing you need to look at is the functions. And if you want to like, you know, get nitty gritty, you can look at my commits um, and see how I cut and paste things and pretend to be a developer sometimes. Um, but yeah, uh, that's it. Any questions? Dude, <laughs> I, uh, I'm just trying to figure out from a, from a user standpoint how, how much I can use this in terms of for my clients because we have build the exact dashboard. same experience. I'm sorry? Yeah, build a dashboard. That's the first thing you the do. Dashboard the dashboard and the capabilities. Yeah. That's for sure is yeah. the number one thing, um, especially yeah. for those. I mean, you make a really good point about the um, marketers and versus developers. I didn't even think about renaming administrator to developer. That's, you know, I got to go back. And make it should it be, in my opinion, it should be called developer because WordPress, the open source project was originally meant for hobbyists, you know, coders, whatever. Now yeah. we have people who are like, in my opinion, have no business installing WordPress website. You know, it's like, it's like someone, I've met people who are like a paralegal. Right. They've come to our meetup with three, with a hacked WordPress website. And they're like, oh, we were using this to store all of our PDFs. How do we get it back? I'm like, call this number and expect to pay $50,000 to get it unhacked and, and recover because it's legal data, you know? And yeah. like, that's like, you know, and, and that's like a lot. And, but WordPress, in my opinion, sold them a lie, which again, like not a lie, but I think WordPress has market confusion right now. And that's like, mm -hmm. and that, you know, in the end can lead to people, you know, if someone else came along with like another, and this is why, and again, in my opinion, why classic press is getting killed because no short codes, no errors, none of that. It all gets removed when you use uh, Gutenberg. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just a great idea. I mean, we've used capabilities before, but you know, giving it different names, giving them different different purpose, um, really can save time in the long run and save me a lot of emails and phone calls. And you know, especially when you get these guys getting in there and they'll muck something up, and I'm like, crap. You know, y'all, hold on, I got to go to the backup, but. Even more so from a dashboard stand, standpoint, I'm going to have to share this with my developer to, to see what kind of things we can do in terms of, um, especially the what columns are viewed, the fe renaming featured image to, you know, we're now building out a site for a salon that does uh, studios, salon studios. So we've got a directory building out for each of the, the members. And yeah, to change out the word featured image to salon logo, you know, yep. um, that's yeah i just got to go back and go through that but i'm going to share your uh and i'm going to i got to collect all these links that wonderful christopher has been putting together as you've been doing this he's been throwing in the links of there so but lisa has a question lisa just you guys just unmute 
just ask your question. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't yeah. a question. It was just more of a comment when, when oh, okay. you were showing the different capabilities and the user, user roles, particularly the user roles. I used to host a training site on Moodle and I was like, oh my God, this looks exactly like the, the layout of when you went in and changed the user roles for Moodle. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I think it's, and if you could see like, again, th these, are, these are some of my favorite people in the space and they don't cover that basic functionality that I think makes WordPress so powerful. Yeah. So. Yeah, Ed, Ed, yeah, that's what I know. I usually when I when I end the meetup, I get all, the entire chat in a text in a text file. So, yeah, I'll just throw this in. When I I'll upload this as a YouTube on our YouTube channel and I'll include um, most all these links in the in the description in the chat. So, from the chat. So, yeah, this is oh my gosh, so good. We had a discussion before about dashboards back in February. Um, I think this least... one blew that one out of the water. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, that one was good, but this one, like your, your whole presentation, my mind yeah. was like blown yeah. up. She, she had a different take on it. It was more, you know, really changing out what the dashboard looks like. Um, but right. yours is more from a user's perspective of every dashboard being different. So I think, I think it's fascinating, but yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? Ed, Mike. I'm good. That was awesome, Victor. Thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah, that I feel was... like whatever I do is no one ever gets questions because they just they want to just run out and like play with it. Like if you're a developer, you just want to grab the repo and go. That's what normally happens when I do dev talks. I notice. Yeah. So. Yeah. But I had I had a question. I mean, it's a great presentation, yeah. um, but um, you talk really fast, so I'm, I was trying to catch up, trying to stay on one topic and. But I, <clears throat> sorry, the New York thing. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> no, you had a lot of good information. You're trying to squeeze in in a, in a short amount of time. Yeah. It's really good. So I, I'm, I just want to make sure I understand correctly what you've put together here is for the back end. Can we use any theme on top of it, or is this also in your theme code? Uh, I would. So you could put it in your theme code, but it's a. Uh, it it totally depends. So it depends on what you want to do, right? Like. If you know that when you change themes, you want to maintain those post types, you should put it in your custom plugin. Uh, so I, I recommend putting custom post types in your plugin uh, so you can use any theme. Uh, but Gutenberg, the benefit of Gutenberg as well is that it's theme agnostic, where it shouldn't rely on your theme. So Gutenberg itself is core WordPress. So I recommend putting in your functions and putting your styles into the theme. So anything where you're styling a block, I would put that in the theme, but anything we were adding, modifying the functionality of Gutenberg and WordPress, I'd put that in your functions plugin. Uh, and, and that's actually, I kind of like document that here uh, where I even say um, project theme, project functionality. And so if you, you know, you'll see in the theme, the only stuff that I have in the theme are like things related. And I think I put a couple things there that shouldn't be in there, but in my opinion, it's all styles, logos, navigation, which is not related to actual, um, uh, functionality like this one is, um, but uh, and it's like, re but this read more link is from the theme. So I just anything theme related put that you that when you change the theme you don't want to keep it. I put in there anything that is uh, functionality you want to keep when you switch themes. Uh, because let you guys know, if, I don't know if I shared this before. Um, uh, so this is like the block unit test. This is actually on my own site. I use this to demo to clients, um, but it's it's literally the same markup that you saw previously on this other page, so on my, on my own, on this uh, demo site. Um, it's the exact same markup, right? Um, because Gutenberg does not render as short codes, doesn't render as anything else. It renders only as HTML, right? Um, and then by it rendering as HTML, I don't know if anyone here plays a Gatsby or headless WordPress or headless environments. Um, this is Gatsby and we did, the only thing we did was CSS. And so this is a Gatsby WordPress page where it's being fed into a headless React envi uh, uh, built environment and it's automatically styled because we just brought in the WordPress styles over here. Um, and so like, it's completely theme agnostic. Like we can like, so this block unit test works on all my Gatsby installs, on my Next.js installs, my WordPress installs. So Gutenberg should be theme agnostic uh, if it's done right. What do you, what do, you do for like the, um, like when, we, when I build out a theme for a client, the Gutenberg blocks don't cut it. I mean, I like there'll be there'll be multiple different types of banners. Uh, there may be a full width or maybe something else. So I I do have them actually put in a class. 
and that will maybe the WP columns uh, block. I'll have them put in a class, and then that will change the WP columns to be full width, say. So and then, so then you column. you actually you can even skip that. So back to them like doing classes. That's called a block pattern. So what you can do, um, you can go into, and I'm just sure. Actually, I can make block patterns in five. Like we do this all the time. We will live them with the client, and we'll say like, "Hey, we're going to make a hero, right?" And I will grab a cover block, right? I'll grab like a. I'll just even I'll just do the slash. I don't even know why I'm bothering with that picker. Um, mm -hmm, cover, right? Um, I will go to my media library. I'll grab uh, Zeus there, uh, and I'm going to make it like you said. Uh, I'm going to go uh, full width, right? I'm going to go um, uh, Doge. I don't mess with Doge, but you know what I mean? Like Doge something out there. Uh, and then um, they've moved this, how to change it. Convert to, where the hell did the convert to go? I don't even know. Anyway, so uh, I could add a heading here, right? And like just say heading um, and I go Doge, right? And so let's say that I want to repeat this everywhere I go, right? Go to the top of the block, go here and group, right? So that block is now grouped. So I'm going to add a class. I'm going to call this Doge, Doge pattern. Right, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna publish it, publish, and now I can go and like style it. I just target the class of Doge pattern. Right now, I'm gonna have to tell the client, hey, every time you want to get like this custom thing where it's like red text, like which I can like I, I'm not gonna do it now. Like you know, uh, Doge the, the Doge hero should always be whatever. Right, you can in um, block patterns that thing that you built out, you can now go and take that block group export it, at, and that's what he does it right here. He groups the blocks, copies the block content, escapes it, then saves it as a PHP. I'm actually, I'm just gonna do it, let's do it live. Let's do it, I'm gonna grab this thing, register block uh, pattern. Let's see if that even works. I'm gonna like, cause I forgot, yesterday we had, I had issues with this. Okay. Uh, but I'll go to like my uh, functions.php. Sorry, like I'm also like, I noticed when you're like a bigger screen, I'm like, I can't, I'm so used to like my big windows. I'm like, oh God, where is this thing? Uh, all right, so I'll add this. I will paste this code. Oh God, that was too much. What happened there? I don't know why I brought all that garbage in. Can you can you just something's wrong here? Whatever. Sorry. Just, like visual to visual when you're on the post, actually do show the code and then just copy that code and then paste it in. Well, so that's you have to. So essentially, the code you're going to get is HTML markup. You have to escape it and turn it into PHP. And oh. so that's what he covers here. You use like this oh. register block pattern. But what essentially he's doing, oh yeah, sorry, it was long code. It's not wrong. So now when I go back to um, my uh, picker, when I go back to like, let's say, uh, where is it, where is it? Here, uh, I'm going to go to posts. Um, I'm going to create a new post. I'm going to go to patterns. And by the way, that's what I mean. Blocks don't, aren't, don't meet that. Uh, and I'm like, I can go uncategorized. And here we go. Boom. Now the client doesn't have that a class. It's automatically, it's a pattern. So a pattern is nothing more than a group of core blocks saved. So you can essentially make a pattern library. And so for certain clients, I have a pattern library of every single thing. Hero, CTAs, Marketo. Because the clients, they always F up the Marketo. So we have Marketo Form 1, Marketo Form 2, Marketo Form 3. And they don't even have, they don't have to go and paste the snippet. They just take the pattern, drop it, and it automatically drops Marketo Form on them. They don't even, they don't even know that they're dropping a fully formed snippet with an HTML and everything. It's just done. And that's covered here, by the way. This should be a blog post, but this is all covered right here. Uh, if, you, if you go through this, this is like a, this is a mini course. I'll drop this in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. Did that help? Did you, did, yes, so yes. instead of adding the class, you're essentially using the pattern, you're using the pattern API to add the class to the group. So now the client, it's like, it's easier for them. They don't, and they yeah. can search, by the way, you can name the patterns. What I do is I, add, I prefix all my patterns with the client name. And so they'll just be like, I don't, I don't care about any of this. They'll type Marketo. They'll type their name. And then they're like, okay, my block. And so, and that separates it from core. Okay, great. Thank you very much. No worries. Awesome, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Questions? No, just gonna have to replay this uh, you know, <laughs> a few times to, to get everything. <laughs> right. Well, um, so Victor, I mean, you're more than welcome to hang out. We usually do the last 15, 20 minutes of just like WP 101. If you, I mean, you're more than welcome to hang out and just, you know, be here. Yeah, I'll <laughs> hang, I'm gonna bring my dog, but oh, okay. my dog's gonna Yay. join the call, so. 
right. So, hey guys, this is the the time where we have some, we spend um, on any WordPress 101 questions. If you guys are on a user side of things, um, yeah, we got a bunch of developers here right now, so now's the time to ask. So um, if anyone's got any questions, how to set something up, they're stuck on an e-commerce, this is it. Um, Dave, anyone know of a plugin for protected content with a login form with name and email to allow viewers to see protected content? I'm using a Divi theme. So you want a form that they fill out and it gives them access. So no password, they just have to fill out a form and it sends them to the protected content. Is that right, Dave? Okay. Well, I mean, what do you all think? I'm th I mean, I don't know in terms of protected content, you could just uh, just use a simple form and then the, the, the landing page the, is that content. Is it one con page, Dave, or is it like a whole section of the site? You can, you can talk, <laughs> it's better if you, if you, several pages. I don't know, what do you, you do think? with memberships, right? Yeah, go ahead. WP memberships or memberships pro or whatever it's called, you could create a membership and then assign users to that membership and then use protected content that way. Then you can protect it at the page level, the post level or at the taxonomy level. Um, Victor just threw in opt-in monsters. There's gated content marketing strategy. So that yeah, because be that removes the member. You don't want to like if you start getting people's emails and stuff and storing it in WordPress. That's what I hate about member plugins. Like if this is gated content, this connects with your CRM or like whatever you're using to market. So like that's why I like gated content more than like a member because I think like a lot of people use the member terminology and mem once you start adding member member capabilities, it gets it can get really complicated. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, just using a simple email form and then getting them into another section. But then I don't know how well that's going to protect the content, though. That's the other, the, the other side of it. So that's why you have to kind of decide protecting content versus a membership. Right. Um, if you're protecting it because it's proprietary content, you definitely yeah. want a membership. If yeah. you're gating it because you want to get emails and, and, and give access, that's gating. So it's like, yeah, that's like where we use a gating strategy for content marketing. Right. So that that's the question you'd ask yourself. Do you want to, is it proprietary content? Then you should do members. But if, if it's content where it's like you want opt-ins, then you want to gate it and use something like that. Yeah. Uh, Dave says, really don't want the user to log in and create a password. Yeah, well, then that's not an opt-in monster. Yeah. That's a gated strategy. Yep, yeah. it's a gated content strategy. Yeah, then you don't want a membership for sure. So anyone else? Uh, yeah, you're welcome, Dave. Anyone else? Can you stuck on a question? All kinds e-commerce. My goals right now is just all performance related stuff. We've got websites that come out of um, different themes that have been monster bastardized and monsterized, and the clients like we want to have better performance. I'm like, well, get rid of your slideshow <laughs> and change your theme. So that's what we're struggling with right now. Is just spending time, I don't know, must be about 15 websites that we're having to go through. So long well, day. That raises an interesting question because somebody mentioned, you know, web.dev earlier and then somebody else threw out Nitro Pack, but, you know, and I tested my site on both of those and I get different scores. So, I mean, which one, which one am I supposed to actually use to say this is, you know, the recommendations that I should be going with? You know, particularly when the scores are, you know, maybe 20 points apart. <laughs> right. You know? I tend to go to web, web.dev only because it's a Google product and they're, they are trying to give me some advice on what they're, what they see us. But Richter, you made a point earlier that they're using these pages. So what was it again? So uh, I shared an article before from web dev studios. So essentially when you're sending those tests, um, the reason, so there's a couple of reasons you're getting different variants. A lot of them use different APIs because there's like Google actually has five different APIs for testing speed. PageSpeed Insights, Lighthouse, Core Web Vitals, there's a couple different uh, APIs. Um, and then GT Metrics in those, they will use those in addition to other APIs such as Cloudflare. So each of them has different APIs. Um, so that's where you're getting variants. In addition, all those services, they, the way that they run a test is, you may not realize this, but you're actually giving them a URL 
they're scaffolding a fake computer, a cloud server, running Chrome on that, v on that test server, getting the results and then giving you the results, right? So you're not even getting test, you're not actually getting, you're getting your website's results in a, I would argue like in a, in a lab. Um, and so the WebDev Studios article I shared, they borrowed from me because I did this for the knot. We rolled it out using Google Tag Manager. What it does is it lets you um, fire the, uh, what, what exactly what Christine is talking about, the Google Web Dev API, because it, it takes all five of them and puts it into core vitals. And then it lets you take all those, those three vital scores. So when anyone visits your site, you're actually getting their experience. So like literally if someone on Opera in India visits your website, it's getting those three numbers from their experience, not a remote computer. Then it sends that data to Google Analytics. That's what that API, it's that article that Web Dev Studios wrote does. Um, and then in Google Analytics, you can go and say what pages need to be, you can get a strategy together. Like you can say to your client, like let's focus on the most, you know, high value pages, um, things like GT metrics and that stuff. Like you're only entering one URL. And again, it's a lab test, not a field test. And so when you're running those tests, on someone's device, it's a field test. And so it's field data. And so it's better than lab data. Yeah. And then the other the, the other thing is not only using different results, you don't even know what server farm you're using. If they're using Google Cloud or AWS and there's a timeout, it's gonna affect your score. Hmm. Awesome. All right, well, is anyone else, else anything? It's about 8.23, usually we end at about 8.30. Anyone have any other questions? I was scrambling going, ah. Oh, Dave, last thing. Using a slider is old school and just use one header image to reflect the main content of the page it's on for SEO optimization. True. Correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get rid of sliders. They're old school and most likely there's been a lot of tests. No one watches them. It's, it's a pure vanity thing. Oh, for sure, they're going to read my 10 slides and watch and read every little picture or read every text and watch every picture. But the answer is no, they don't. They don't watch it. They look at the first slide, then they move on to the, they scroll down. So they're not even. I think it's also people's inability to make a decision. <laughs> yeah. They can't pick exactly. one. <laughs> exactly. We've got a client right now that, that has a nationwide uh, furniture company. And they love their photos, just love them. And we can't get them to get, we can't get them out of a slider. Like they just insist on having these huge sliders and, but they want their performance to be high. We're like, you gotta get rid of the slider. That's all I can tell you, you gotta get rid of the slider, but they won't, so. In that scenario, you can combine Google Optimize with Google yeah. Analytics mm -hmm. and you just run a split test on those two pages and show which page has better performance in Google Analytics, like who actually visits more pages. And so then you just run a split test with it because Google Optimize lets you add and remove elements on a page. Uh, yeah, and yeah, so you yeah, could yeah. have, so you could have the slider on one version or another, run mm -hmm. the test for a month and go, hey, look, people who visit this page, they spend more time on site. Right. And that's, that's what I do with those. Right, right. I just so essentially show the proof of the problem. Improved. I just run that test. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll try that. It's a good idea. Especially when you can show data. That's the most important thing. Yep. That's what I've been trying to work on a little bit more is, is um, way more data infused uh, information. So uh, we're using a lot of things coming in from different sources. You know, when we're doing um, letters that go out, we've got QR codes on those with special numbers so that we can track exactly which letter worked, which postcard worked, um, which business card worked, you know, all of that gets tracked, numbered. And now I can, I can completely follow through where people came from. So we're doing a lot of really data decision, decision making based on that. So yeah, it's good stuff. All right, guys. Well, I think we're good. Hey, Ed's doing a hand emoji. I don't know if that means anything, or did he accidentally do that? Oh, raise a yeah, hand. A question for you, Victor. Um, <laughs> what? what are some of the fun things that you have put into dashboards for users? I know you mentioned Google Sheets, and I know Google Analytics can go in there, and there's a lot of other things. But just what are some of the other like cool things that you found that you could put into a dashboard in WordPress for somebody that were maybe a little unique? Uh, sales teams, we put in leads generated content teams, we put top performing content, uh, to let them know, like, you know, and that's just Google analytics API, like letting them know the most popular content again, Google sheets with any API. Um, 
And actually, Google Sheets came out with a no-code solution to connect to Google. There's like, there is a Google Analytics add-on for Google Sheets. So you don't even have to learn to code. You just spit it to a Google Sheet, and Google Sheet lets you export, lets you create charts, and you can embed your chart anywhere you want. Um, and so uh, sales stuff, um, uh, translation uh, goals, uh, training videos, uh, anything when we add new features and we need to get a bunch of people to know how to use it. Um, I'm trying to think what else we put in there. You know, it's like, we don't, I don't really get too creative. It's more about just like what, you know, what needs to go, what they need. Um, but it's more about like getting, um, I'm trying to think of anything like that we've done recently. Uh, we do put core web vitals in there. Like a lot of Google analytics stuff, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think what I could share about the not, let me think. Oh yeah, so for like, um, we do a lot of experiments, right? And so with Google Optimize, and like I was saying, like switching the hero, et cetera, um, to, in, to, in, to uh, get everyone on board, not in WordPress, but like similar to WordPress, but we have these dashboards we create for user experiences where like we will let people know, like, you know, uh, how many people view their wedding registry? How many people like view this thing? How many people do that? So the same thing, like we do that like at the knot. And then so for WordPress, for a lot of clients, um, you know, we will add something like a modal block or like a Marketo form or some kind of new, you know, some kind of new opt-in somewhere, right? And we will let them know like how many times it's been seen. And so every month we're doing some kind of feature. So we more, we more use it almost like the same way when you log in to like, because essentially what you think about the dashboard is a greeting screen, right? And WordPress is trying to get you into meetups, into all these other things. So what we try to think is like, what does this person need to see and what do they need to know? Um, so we do like the column is the training module, uh, the like, you know, the tracking module and the final column, we just add, um, no worries, thanks guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then the final column, we usually add like a new feature that benefits them. But also the other thing we started to do too now, the reason I have all these articles is I now am starting to share articles in our dashboards to educate clients because a lot of clients now, you know, with Core Web Vitals, we're like, dude, we got we did that last June. And they're like, oh, but my boss is in it. And so we'll have an article in there, like what you need to know about Core Web Vitals. And we'll link in there and like, and that really helps. And it saves a lot of time because you, it's amazing. I don't know if you guys have done this. Our WordPress meetup will survey people how they heard about us. So many people were coming to us from the WordPress meetup dashboard because they were finding us in the, in the, in the WordPress dashboard. And so like that's something too, that like, uh, you know, it's amazing how many people use it that way. So think about that. That's like a big thing. Like it's, you know, and then on our dashboard, we have, a, we use client portal. And so I have a client portal dashboard for myself where I log in and I can see how many times clients are logging into my client portal dashboard, how many they're interacting, if they're giving feedback on time, if they're actually logging in, if they haven't logged in in a week. And I could see who's using our dashboards to make sure they're like not emailing us and they're going through the dashboard. I don't know if that was a good answer. I don't know if it was like, but that's all I got. Absolutely. I think that was the thing that most intrigued me was just like, I know that there's way more I could do with dashboards that I'm not doing now. Um, I've already done a bunch with like limiting features and changing roles and things like that and custom role switching. But the dashboards, I think, is like undiscovered country for me. So appreciate that. Yeah. Think about all the tools you log into. Every time you log into Salesforce, every time you log into Active Campaign, they have a dashboard system. They have a, you know something, hey, welcome to this. Hey, we added this. Hey, we did that. You could be doing the same thing. And the same thing too, what I was excited about, we don't do the health thing, but like, we're like, well, I'll, I will sometimes post articles about like some of the, the features that WordPress has added. So WordPress added like image sizes, like where like you can limit the, the size of the max image that can be uploaded. So, you know, we went and said like, what this means for you and like, you know, more things and like it's rolled into core. So we don't need this plugin anymore. And so I'll actually tell clients we can kill a plugin or functionality and say, hey, this now belongs to core. So you don't have to worry about it anymore. And they love that because like, oh, great. Now you're you're giving us vanilla WordPress as much as possible. So we could fire you one day. And then they just keep expanding the contract. It's crazy. <laughs> right, why are you licking me? This is my dog, by the way. I don't know if anyone's seen. This is Zeus. Your dog is really He's a little, he's like, he has a bed head. Why are you biting me? I don't get you. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna put him down. He probably wants to go back to bed. Anyway. Same, all right, bro. Uh, yeah, I should jump. It's 9.30 over here. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you guys all enjoyed that. If you liked it, like tweeted it, tweet it, share it out, like whatever. It's cool. We'll it helps me It'll out be on SEO YouTube stuff. too. I'll, I'll share awesome. it with you, Victor, when it gets on YouTube. So cool. All right, cool. So, yes, yeah, so y'all can kind of slowly go through the <laughs> pause <laughs> as he jumps around, so. All right. Thanks guys so much. Happy to see you all. See you guys next month. Uh, send me, if you guys, I'm looking for speakers and topics. So 
throw them over to me. Curious. Love to love to share. All right, guys. Uh, See you guys later. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Thank Victor. You. Bye, everyone.